Nature Works Podcast. Conversations with extraordinary guests who are working to protect, regenerate, and better understand the natural world. With your host, Mike Weeks. Welcome to Nature Works Podcast, where this week I'm speaking with Lida Petsud, PhD. Lida is a senior strategic conservation and fisheries management professional with practical policy, technical and management skills. And if that all sounds a little bit academic, don't worry, she's absolutely superb at breaking down really difficult concepts so that idiots like me can understand. In this episode, we discuss fisheries management and illegal fishing across the Coral Triangle, and she actually schools me on what illegal fishing really means. We have to touch on the Netflix documentary Sea Spiracy, and Lida highlights both the pros and cons of that film. And we dive into the concept of shifting baselines, which is where over time we people begin to accept new standards of what's acceptable for the natural world whilst losing sight of how wild and diverse it should really be. Now, if you enjoy this episode and others, please share it because it gets lonely in here unless you do. And share it with folks who care about the natural world. NatureWorks podcast is free of sponsors and advertising. And our aim is to provide honest and unbiased insights into how we can help protect, restore and regenerate the only natural world that we have. So you were previously living here in Bali, weren't you? Before moving back? Yeah, I actually still do. But um, we haven't been able to visit our um, you know, elderly parents and our kids uh, so much over the last couple of years. So we took a couple of months uh, during the European summer and we're here now. Yeah, we I will have... be back in Indonesia soon. Yeah. Okay. And do you live in Bali? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So then you'll be able to come in for a second interview in the podcast room that we had specially built, as long as you're not claustrophobic, because it is a soundproof box. Can, awesome. That's impressive. I can, yeah. I can show I you. Hold to. on. I can show you. Let me, let me move the camera. We've I can got, see. Oh, right, you can see. We've got it all going on in here. It's, um, we are, oh, Great. Uh, yeah. I'm back in, in October, but we're going to go at the, in October. We're going to go to see if everything works out. But anyway, I'll be back early October. Yeah. Wonderful. So uh, we're in Chimagi and oh, we have a yeah. we have a, an organic farm here as well, which by October time will be bursting with fruits and vegetables and and uh, probably some fish as well. We, we've built a water filtration system because, as you know, the Subak water is filthy, especially by the time yeah. it gets to us in the last mile before the sea. So because we didn't want to use that water on the crops that were growing, we've built a uh, a 10 meter channel of gravel and vetiver grasses because the vetiver sucks all the pollutants out of the water and then that water ends up in a pond that also has vetiver and lotus and lots of other uh, toxin um, uh, or detoxing plants and then that water then after that goes onto our land so it's, it's wow. a simple but uh, we hope effective way of filtering out a lot of the wastewater that comes down here I love when come and be uh, your guinea pig to try and eat some of your fruits or vegetables. <laughs> yeah, so def- definitely. My children are my <laughs> guinea pigs. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, all right. You love them a lot. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about that. They're, yeah, it, one of them's hair has turned green, and my wife has actually asked me a couple of days ago whether that was something to do with the new um, uh, biological fertilizers that we're using, which are bacterial based. And um, I, I pointed out if he, your kid is blonde, I think it's the swimming pool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's from the chlorine in the swimming pool. You're exactly right. Yeah, he is blonde. Right, yeah. yeah, we f- we figured yeah. we figured that one out after a few Google uh, searches. <laughs> so, Lida, I'm a, I'm aware that um, we're on a tight schedule and there's a lot to talk about. Um, you've got a, an extensive career in marine biology and conservationism, and um, Grace, who introduced us. For this podcast she said make sure you start by asking Lida about how the places the wild places especially the underwater wild places that she used to visit have changed over the period of time since she's been viewing them and I thought that was a good place to start because I really want to touch on this shifting baselines concept um, would you mind just first of all telling us a bit about your background and then 
also about uh I guess that's a good place to talk about where you started and what places used to look like versus now. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, look, I mean, um, I come from the Netherlands and uh, my grandparents and parents came from uh, dairy farms. Uh, but, um, you know, so I had basically no connection to the ocean, really. Uh, but, you know, this Wageningen Agriculture University, where I really wanted to study, uh, gave me a lot of opportunities uh, to see other types of uh, food producing systems. And that's really where I got interested uh, and motivated by one of the professors in uh, thinking about how, um, you know, ocean coastal ecosystems uh, are important to produce food and renewable uh, sources of food. So, um I have to say that uh, in the uh, early years of my study, uh, I wasn't sure exactly where I was going to go. Uh, I was uh, therefore advised by my uh, supervisor to go to Sri Lanka, uh, where I met my now husband for 30 years. We married uh, very soon after we met. And he was uh, looking at fisheries um, systems in freshwater lakes. And while the whole uh, Sri Lanka experience was just amazing for many, many reasons, uh, that ecosystem was very muddy. Uh, the fish had nasty spines. Uh, there were crocodiles to be sort of like, you know, uh, wary of as we were uh, trying to do some uh, fisheries related research. The other thing that I found um, because I was just interning at that time, very interesting was on one side of that uh, inland reservoir there was a village with fishermen um, who uh, were always ending up in trouble in fights. Uh, and on the other side of the lake was a tiny lake. There was a village with fishers who seemed to be uh, very calm and doing much better, also having plots of land. So I, while I was there, I started realizing that, you know, the uh, same type of, uh, let's call it food producing system uh, can serve people very differently and uh, what ultimately, I don't know if this is a scientifically underpinned uh, sort of conclusion, uh, turned out to be uh, one of the reasons for the difference of these two, you know, fishing villages using the same, you know, food producing ecosystem was that, uh, you know, the village where people were getting in trouble with each other all the time uh, had a habit of uh, basically going home after fishing uh, going to the local bar and having some local arak and getting sort of you know <laughs> affected by uh, bragging rights and whatnot whereas the uh, fishes from the other side of the village uh, they came home uh, they uh, smoked some <laughs> weed and basically uh, gave the catch to their wives uh, and slept it off uh, tending their nets fixing their nets in the afternoon if they felt like it but generally, we're just very more mellow jello. And so back to then Wageningen University and what I'm doing now, uh, Wageningen University gave me the opportunity to combine basically whatever it was that I thought you know, was relevant, uh, anthropology, economics, uh, sociology, other types of development studies with that uh, general and, and for me increasingly more interesting uh, field of food producing systems and the ocean. Again, that was not the ocean. So after my husband finished his PhD, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to write my PhD proposal. And we went to the deep blue, clear tropical waters of Indonesia. <laughs> I, I love that story because, yeah, and actually it reminds me of um a, a, a sort of study that inadvertently arose about uh animals in lab settings where uh, a bunch of rabbits were being fed a certain type of diet to test them for diabetes and they found that all of the rabbits um in one area were more immune and i that's not i don't know if that's the correct term but they were less uh, predicated to get diabetes than a set of other rabbits but these were rabbits being fed the same food in the same zone with the same lighting and the same lab conditions and they couldn't figure it out until they put a camera on the rabbits to monitor them and what they noticed was was that the cleaner who came in was a very small lady who was only able to reach the rabbits in the first three layers of cages and couldn't reach the fourth and fifth. And she was taking them out and giving them a cuddle 
while she was cleaning the place. And the rabbits who were cuddled were, were less likely to get diabetes than the rabbits on the cages above. And it's that same thing, like the, the housing of, your, of the group on the other side of the lake and the proximity to marijuana uh, rather than the proximity to a bar selling arak transforms the, the, co the context, right? And we, and, and, and we often don't realize just how, um, how sort of vulnerable we are to the conditions around us, the environmental enrichment or the opposite, the environmental degradation. Um, hence why, you know, for me with two young kids, I'm all about now, the rest of my life is committed to trying to fix this bloody insane environmental catastrophe that we have on our hands. Now, you... You, you've seen that firsthand. You've been, you know, you're not new to this game. I am only in the last couple of years. I'm, I'm an unex, unintended environmentalist. You know, it sort of happened upon me moving to Bali, seeing the mess here, saying, I can't see this garbage going out in the ocean anymore. I have to stop it. I have to clean it. I can't see these chemicals going on the land. I have to stop it. I have to clean it. But I have to show it first. I can't go telling anyone what to do until we've done it. So that's what we're doing. Um, but you've been here how many years in Indonesia in the Coral Triangle? Well, it's been, it was 94 when we moved to Indonesia. And before that, we were in Sri Lanka for three years. So it's been quite a while. Yeah, I guess uh, 30 so years. What, yeah. what are the biggest changes you've seen in that time to the marine environments and yeah. more broadly? Exactly. So look, I mean, I love that uh, you, you do this through and with your family. So uh, when I didn't have children yet, um, we would go diving in the Maldives. This is before, um, you know, coral bleaching uh, in 1998 happened. And also it was before uh, the Maldives allowed for uh, reef fisheries. The fisheries there used to be and still are very important on uh, tuna. But uh, we, we enjoyed going to the Maldives, just getting away from the bug and the, you know, thorny kind of little fish and the crocodiles also. Uh, but um, I was then later in my uh, career with WWF able to visit and work with amazing people in the Maldives and shocked to see the difference even within the time span of, a, I guess, a decade, 10 years. Now, with regards to Indonesia, as I become a scuba diver in the Maldives, uh, you know, I, I found Indonesia, obviously, there was this, this, was this ultimate pinnacle treasure trove of, of biodiversity. And when I first came, I was uh, diving in my research area. I'd managed to convince my uh, professor that uh, I needed to do independent fisheries research, which means that you're not only measuring, uh, you know, what the fishes have caught, and you can learn a lot from that. So I used to go up and down the, the coast of uh, southwest Sulawesi to all these landing sites and measuring their catch and interviewing them. But I had to also do independent research with, I managed to uh, sort of convince everybody that that included scuba diving. And so what I saw there was, um, first of all, a lack of large uh, predators. And in, in my context, predators were sharks, you know, basically the, uh, you know, the, the, the fish uh, on the top of the food chain. Um, but I, I met with uh, Indonesian and, and other international uh, researchers, there was a really nice uh, time, who were looking at very other types uh, of organisms and mechanisms on the reef and they said no, no no you've got it all wrong this is the center of biodiversity and it's amazing we cannot stop counting the species and i'm like what's going on so i learned quite early in my uh, studies that um you know obviously uh you can compare uh when when, when you look at one reef um you know uh, that it's pretty it's prettier uh you know it, it, it's easier to swim but uh, even uh, different researchers on the same reef looking at different parts of such an ecosystem will conclude that it's, you know, in dire states because I was starting to think that this particular place was overfished, at least for sharks and the top reef predators. Whereas other researchers would say, no, 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 you know, this is just a source of speciation. And we both had a point. So um, then as we had kids, um, we took them uh, to see with us. Uh, my husband is also a marine uh, scientist or a fisheries biologist. And so then as they learned how to scuba dive, I started looking through their eyes and they saw things that amazed them. Whereas I was already a little bit worried that, you know, 
half of the type of big fish and turtles that I used to see in the Maldives firstly and the early years in Indonesia, we hardly saw them. I couldn't point them out to them. So this shifting baseline that you just talked about a couple of minutes ago, I started to really um, uh, experience what that means at the level of my uh, own family and throughout the course of, say, 15 to 20 years. And ever since, I've tried to do something with that. Are you able to uh, identify when, for instance, in Indonesia, the the large predator species would have been on the decline? Is there any historical data that you can draw on from for that? Or were you one of yeah, the first biologists is. to notice it? No, um, What's really interesting is that actually the uh, fishery statistical system that Indonesia has um, uh, been implementing is it goes back a long time, uh, you know, the, since the 80s, and it was extremely well designed. However, the purpose for that system to track, you know, what was being caught uh, at the time was really uh, to promote and to possibly further develop certain fisheries in Indonesia for economic and social, uh, you know, needs and, and, and benefits. And so uh, it, you've stuck your head in the water. The, the, the huge number of species, it's a multi-species uh, environment, um, makes it difficult to actually understand, um, you know, the biology of how these various, uh, again, in this case, marine food producing ecosystems uh, are, are supposed to look like, right? And so while the statistical system since the 80s kept really good track of mostly the commercial uh, species or the species uh, that were being caught for which uh, the Indonesian government or some investors were thinking to develop uh, a fishery, even in remote parts of Indonesia, uh, a lot of the species had not been tracked. Now that's one thing. The second thing is, uh, I'm sure you've had uh, red snapper um, within even a category of, say, red snapper. It turns out that there is, you know, maybe a hundred different species. And why that matters, even if you if you say, you know, we know exactly how many red snappers are caught uh, since 1985, for example, why it matters that a red snapper have possibly even more, but let's say for the cause of this argument, a hundred uh, different species, these different snapper species have different life histories. And what that means is that certain snapper species will mature uh, at a very small size because they will never grow bigger than, let's say, 30 centimeters of length. So other snapper species will mature much later when they are, for example, 35 centimeters long because their maximum size could be even up to a meter. So when we're catching or when we're seeing that fishers are catching, let's say, red snappers of about 25 centimeters, in that statistical system, it's not possible to then uh, understand whether that's a problem because you're actually catching, you know, let's say uh, the babies of a species that could actually grow all the way to a meter right, which would produce a lot more food, but also uh, a fish that gets mature would produce the next generation. And that's a sustainable, uh, you know, cycle. That's just the life history that would then, you know, help a sustainable fishery. And so those are some of the things that we've um, seen in the last couple of years. And I think the, uh, the awareness of government and fishermen uh, and NGOs and scientists of the challenges that this multi-species system in Indonesia brings is very high. What now needs to happen is to uh, apply practical solutions uh, in order to still be able to say, you know, I'm looking at uh, information and that helps me make a management decision which will ensure a strong fishery into the future. Yeah, and I think also living here in Indonesia, I've been, I've spent a lot of time in developing countries throughout my life. I, I mean, I spent many months in Haiti, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. I was there after the earthquake, but coming here after living in Boulder, Colorado for the three and a half years before here, which is as bad as 
privileged and wealthy and focused on leisure time as you can find anywhere in the world. I came here and it was a, especially during COVID, because we, we came here literally when everything was shut down. And it was a stark reminder how people actually live and how little people live on. And one of the realizations or points when I realized that in the first few weeks was when the lady who's the, uh, her husband is a local fisherman and she came around selling um, some flatfish, which we bought, and then a bag of oyster, uh, sorry, uh, lobsters. And, you know, those black spiny lobsters. And I opened up the bag and these things were, they were tiny. They were like, they were more like jumbo shrimp. And I said to her, right. I'm pretty sure these are illegal. I, I didn't, yeah, I mean, I'm right. still learning Bahasa Indonesian, mm -hmm. but, you know, I asked one of our people in the house to communicate. These are, these are illegal. And she's like, yeah, I know, but, you know, that's what my husband's caught and I need the money. And so I said yeah. to her, look, I'll buy them off you, but we're, I'm going to take my sons down to the beach and we're going to put them back in to the water. I'm telling you that because I don't want you to buy them off you and then you go and get more of these of this size because we won't buy them again. And yeah. we we did buy them and we did take them down to the to the beach and we let them go. And she looked at me like I was a complete lunatic for even when I told her this. But the very next week she came back with a bag of small lobsters. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not buying them. I can't do this again. I'm pretty sure it's illegal. Okay, the next week she came back and the next week. And I think it took her three or four times of coming back with small lobsters that she actually finally grasped that I'm not going to buy these things. But there was a sense of desperation. She's like, we, we know we don't have any money. We, we've been reliant upon tourism and we're not throwing these things back in at the moment because it's survival, as you know, as it got very difficult for a, a lot of people here. So um, uh, that leads me to my, my question. It's, it's easy for us to, as wealthy westerners to come in and tell people that how they need to manage their ecosystems of course and i i interviewed steve jobs uh, sorry steve jobs <laughs> yeah uh, no not steve jobs steve box <laughs> a very different character right. altogether uh, i think you know steve don't you he's a phd yes marine, yeah, yeah marine biologist he's a he's a great guy and and he was telling me about how for them fisheries management is actually about behavioral change it's like how do you get the local communities to to buy into it and to manage it themselves and to understand the value of it rather than just going out and catching everything and you know we'll throw everything in the frying pan and eat it or try and sell it so um i do you have much experience with the with that side of things the behavioral change part how do you actually get the communities it's one thing to say we need to do this we need to do that but how do you actually get people to perceive that in poor developing countries where their life typically depends on what they catch yeah that, that is the question uh that i think uh you know people like myself and and, and you know others uh, are always uh asking themselves the um i you know i i know what steve said i listened to his podcast was very good um he's a smart man i think where i'm going is um and based on my experience is um, you know, behavioral change is not just of the actor catching the lobster of, or the fish, but uh, bringing uh, various actors together that basically all <laughs> are part of the change that's required. I like this, um, I've been uh, talking about it with a number of colleagues who've been around Indonesia for quite a while as well, for example, Peter Maus, um, this idea of high performing fisheries. And so, those uh, include many things that are important for coastal communities. Uh, conditions going out uh, at sea that are more safe, uh, that may include, you know, having uh, communication options available, um, having uh, the opportunity not to be forced uh, to go out during uh, bad weather seasons. Um, high performing fisheries uh, also includes um, reducing uh, wastage. And so when you talk about uh, the tiniest uh, scale of fisheries, uh, you know, the hygiene and the way that they treat their fish is not always optimum. And so uh, by uh, improving or helping these fishers to improve the way that they keep their catch at the premium quality, they will also receive 
uh, a higher price for it. Uh, a high performing fishery would also include um, elements related to uh, having a feedback be between say, you know, uh, the information, and that could be a fisherman just looking at what he caught that day, right? If the husband of, of that lady, you know, keeps seeing that in these days or in the area where he is in the estuary, you know, these uh, lobsters are tiny, 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 that is information that could help him think maybe he should wait a couple of months and go back to this estuary when these little lobsters are a little bit bigger, or perhaps he should ask someone else to go to another location where the more mature lobsters are. And so there are many elements of what I like to sort of see going forward, high performing fisheries. And not all of these elements need to be, uh, you know, including or, or the burden needs to be put uh, on the fisherman himself uh, or his family uh, to change his behavior. There are, of course, and, and this is a lot where, you know, where I work, there's a lot of uh, other actors that can make it easier and as a result, therefore, uh, more sustainable for uh, fishers to uh, to be part of a, you know, of, of, of a sustainable livelihood. Yeah, and I guess you're, we're talking about trying to get small scale local fishermen to change their behaviours. Meanwhile, there's these massive trawlers a few miles out dredging everything in sight right and there we also have to be aware that not in indonesia though <laughs> not no not yeah. well they're not, not no indonesia. but there's plenty of illegal fishing fleets that come into indonesia i mean tens of thousands uh, is, is my understanding over each year is that not no i don't think no i don't think so i don't think that uh, there's illegal fishing fleets coming into indonesia uh, at, at that uh, scale i think there's uh benefits in uh, trying to understand what is meant with illegal fishing. So there is, of course, a lot of uh, uh, there's growing awareness with a lot of discussion about IUU fishing, which is illegal, unregulated and unreported fishing. And uh, unregulated, uh, that's very common in many parts of uh, you know, the world, which basically means that there are no rules or regulations or laws or policies that somehow uh, intends or, or, or are applied to manage uh, fishing activities, right? So there you have the U of the IUU. Uh, unreported is also very common all over the world. Uh, it basically means that the catches and the landings or perhaps the locations where somebody was fishing are not registered or, or, or reported anywhere. So there's uh, information missing uh, if that information would be reported, it makes it easier for fisheries managers to do their job and to uh, manage a fishery. Now, that's the second U. If you then talk about illegal, there's a lot of illegal fisheries, even in Indonesia. <laughs> if you take it to the real world of where the meaning of the words of being uh, not legal. So, for example, uh, fishing in uh, marine protected areas in uh, particular zones, uh, which are no take, so they're exclusive, that nobody can take anything. People that go fishing there are part of illegal fishing. Uh, there are many types of illegal fishing uh, that basically uh, relate to having, uh, let's say, uh, a different type of gear on boards than uh, what your license uh, says. So you may be licensed, you may report your catch, um, it may be that you're fishing in a regulated type of a fishery, but um, on the way to uh, go for it, you know, to catch some tuna, uh, you're throwing out a net and uh, you're taking some other fish uh, that also is illegal. So, so I think that um, you're right that, uh, you know, illegal fishing obviously, uh, you know, is, doesn't help. Uh, for small uh, coastal communities uh, that uh, depend on, uh, you know, on, on these food producing systems. Uh, it also doesn't help for, you know, the thousands of uh, crew members on these larger vessels. And so people tend to say, you know, industrial fishing, almost as if it's a bad thing, but people who work on those larger vessels are often also uh, quite poor. Um, but the, 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 the point that you make about, uh, you know, large trawlers uh, sort of, you know, looking at a different scale of fishery, 
uh, it's a good point when, when those uh, operate within the areas where they're not allowed to operate and, and in Indonesia that is very clearly uh, regulated by law then indeed they're absolutely illegal and uh, they should be uh, apprehended and taken out and one of the examples of that is um, uh, you know the shrimp trolls in uh, eastern Indonesia uh, they catch shrimp they want to catch shrimp and they uh, the ones that are of a large uh, you know large vessels they operate for very large vessels and they come in uh, inshore which is the zone for the smaller type vessels then they're absolutely illegal yeah you're right you know one of the reasons that I've started this podcast is because I want answers like the one you just gave me where People have said to me, why are you doing an environmental podcast? You know, you can do it because my background is actually, I've worked for nearly 20 years as a consultant in, in human performance. Why aren't you doing a podcast on that? Because because actually I'd be arguing all the time with the guests on on the, probably, because I have my opinion. And this is because, this podcast, because yeah, I yeah. don't, answers like that. You just gave me a description of illegal fishing that, uh, have, having been talking about it now for the last three or four months with different people, no one's given me a description of it just like that. And and I uh, I was getting goosebumps as you were explaining it to me because <laughs> it is this throwaway, it, uh, you know, it's too, um, it's it's just too compartmentalized, like illegal fishing. Okay, it must be all bad guys exactly. on big trawlers. Exactly. I like that you say it that way because, you know, if it's, if it stays like that and sort of sticks in this box of, you know, bad, uh, it's all bad, then it's very hard to try and address it, right? Because, you know, what I like about your podcast and, of course, what some of your other guys have been talking about, you know, you're always looking for solutions. And there's not, we know this, I'm always going to say it, there's not one solution for the problem. But <laughs> if you are not addressing the right problem, how can you even imagine a solution? And so it's just not useful to, uh, you know, uh, continue and, and misunderstand and, and, and discuss about illegal fishing in a way that uh, currently, I agree with you, unfortunately, is still how most people are looking at it. It's yeah. not useful. Absolutely. And um, you've just set yourself up for me to ask you about those solutions. But before... <laughs> <laughs> before I before before I do the other part of that answer where I think I'm probably getting goosebumps is I've been under this impression for over a year and a half because I've spoken to members of the Navy and the Coast Guard and and a bit like you were saying certain marine biologists will look at a reef and they'll think it's flourishing and others will think it's dying because of where they're putting their attention if you if you train someone to be a hammer everyone looks like a nail and in the Navy and the Coast Guard's case, they're seeing a considerable amount of illegal fishing vessels that they're going out and intercepting, and they're probably in dire conditions yeah. in some cases, etc. So I've had, I've had a lot of narrative where I've sort of built this image of tens of thousands of illegal fishing vessels just raping and pillaging Indonesia's waters. And it's a, it's a heartbreaking vision to hold. I've tried explaining it to my kids, luckily not in those numbers, and talking about the fact that people's lives do depend upon it enormously and at the same time. But now you've given me the nuance and I'm going to actually, after this podcast, I'm going to tell my kids that I have a better understanding of it. So I, I appreciate that. You did set yourself up though for the, the solutions part of this, which is, <laughs> which okay, is, bring it on. <laughs> well, I'm, you know what I'm, uh, I mean, I, we're, we're all in the same, I hesitate to use the word fight because I don't like this kind of whole idea that it's a war you know, we're trying to create some harmony. The other day, my seven-year-old said, Dad, I don't, what does the word harmony mean? Because you've used it three times about the land. And I had to stop and think, well, it kind of means without harm, I think. I'm not going to pull out the English dictionary. But it's aligning ourselves with what's beneficial for everyone involved. Um, um, and so it's impossible for anyone to have a single solution or even even you know just something you can take off the shelf as much as unless you're a politician and then you've always got one of course but it never actually works you just need that to get the votes um but uh you've obviously been in this game long enough to have a deep understanding of the complexity of it so what are the solutions that you would let's say tomorrow you're in a position of absolute power to be able to create a new initiatives what would you do <laughs> so i think that uh I, I keep learning and I, one of the things that I, I would uh, hold up is, you know, 
I, I, ne I never know it. Um, and because I'm very aware of that, uh, I like to learn and ask other people if they know it. And often they also don't know, but by talking through uh, what is the real problem, uh, it's not difficult to find a solution. I can give you a couple of examples of what I mean with that. So, um, for example, uh, the uh, Indonesian uh, tuna uh, fleets, basically the, the tuna sector, over the last couple of decades has uh, really developed from uh, having been introduced uh, to tuna fisheries by, this is really cool history, uh, Japanese and master fishers to, you know, a, a strong and, and a very able national fleet with a number of different types of, you know, fishing gears. Uh, anyway, Indonesia wanting to be responsible to their neighbors because tuna don't stop, uh, you know, they don't, uh, they don't need a passport, obviously, they swim large distances. So they don't stop at the, uh, let's call you know, the sovereign water boundary of Indonesia. Uh, they joined what is called these regional fisheries management organizations, which look at our oceans, our seas, at a really uh, big scale and how different countries have the right and therefore also the responsibility to uh, use, for example, tuna, which is a highly uh, valuable uh, resource. Now, Years ago, uh, the uh, Indonesian government was uh, a bit uh, challenged with uh, complying to the minimum rules of being a member to one of these regional fisheries management organizations. The benefit of joining such an organization were going to be multiple. Uh, they would get uh, you know, access to research, uh, capacity building of Indonesian scientists, but also allocation of quota of these valuable tuna that are swimming in the high seas, right? Which is the oceans that basically nobody owns, yeah? But they were challenged to comply with some of the minimum requirements in order to become a full member. And what that then turned out to be mostly, uh, you know, was ca caused by um, a, a bit of a fear uh, of asking fishers to share data on what they were catching. And so the, um, the lack of data from Indonesia on what was going on in the tuna sector uh, started to generate uh, emotions or sort of sensitivities from other uh, nations to say, ah, Indonesia is a black box, they must be hiding something. Whereas it was just as simple, quote unquote, as a uh, disconnect or lack of communication between government and private sector. Once that was clear, it was very easy to solve that because just pointing out what the benefits were and why the Indonesian government wanted to join this regional fisheries management organization. We have lots of benefits for the, for the private sector. Once that was uh, articulated, the private sector said, yeah, we'll share our information because, you know, uh, we like to be a responsible member of this regional organization. So that's just one example of where first I didn't know the solution to that, but uh, you start seeing uh, what the possible cause of the problem is, and then you nail that. It's not so complex, yeah? You nail the, the real, uh, let's say, root of that problem, and then ask people whether they can solve it. And then actually, in many cases, they can. And so I've had so many, um, you know, of such uh, experiences that, uh, you know, I, ca I can't give you the, the golden nuggets of, you know, if you had a million dollars, what would you do? Other than, I would say, uh, really <laughs> try to, in a way, be as scientific as you can. And what I mean with it is really drill down to what the actual problem is and then uh, put a bunch of people together that uh, share the same understanding, that, under you know, they, they, they're, they're part of that problem and then uh, see what they can figure out uh, to solve it. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll say one more thing, and that, you know, I, 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 I'm quite, um, sort of where I'm now in, in, in my phase of my career, um, I find it very difficult um, to uh, hear this narrative about uh, big fisheries being bad and uh, poor small fishermen. So this whole uh, concept of a high-performing fishery applies to every 
elements, yeah, small scale, uh, artisanal, but also uh, industrial, big scale. Because, you know, just uh, again, you know, being here in, in uh, Cornwall, but also uh, in other countries, um, the uh, economic importance, the significance of large scale fisheries to so many people who are not all filthy rich, you know, needs to not be uh, misunderstood. And, um, you know, us being able to eat seafood with this you know, much better fatty, uh, you know, fats, it continues to be something that, that you know, everybody in the world needs to be able to enjoy. But so um, the point about, uh, you know, understanding really that it's not easy, that there are simple uh, elements of a problem. And then you put people together and say, well, do you share this problem? Yeah. Nobody wants to catch turtles uh, as bycatch. Fishermen love the ocean. They don't want to kill a turtle. They want to they want to catch a tuna. So then find the solution to that particular problem. So I don't know if that's uh, scalable, but I think, uh, you know, in my little sort of world and uh, little maybe sphere of influence, if I have any of it at all, uh, that's sort of how I approach things. Yeah. I, I absolutely love your your pragmatism which is paired with optimism as well it's yeah. like you're not you're not you're not stamping your fist on the table and crying and saying the oceans are ruined and we must stop eating fish right now like the um the the sea i dare i mention it i have mentioned it but i mentioned it to steve on the interview and he sort of held his head in his hands the sea spiracy video which i'm have you seen it that Netflix. Yes, video. I have. Yes, yeah. I have. Which yeah. which just paints a picture of absolute doom and gloom. We all have to go vegan tomorrow. I'm not picking that up from you <laughs> right now that, <laughs> that you're you're buying into that. But but it, it is a, a question of mine, both because I'm deeply personally interested and I think people, listeners are, is what is your what is your view of the general health of the oceans we know it's full of plastic and we know that there's a lot of problems but is it as bad as the media the mainstream media likes to make out or are the solutions going to outpace the problems i mean from a you know from a from a, a global perspective not just indonesia uh, what's your view on the, the future of our oceans yeah, so I think they just started this uh, UN Ocean Conference in uh, Lisbon uh, yesterday, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, so uh, people who are there, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, will have an answer to that question. But from my perspective, I think, um, and Sea Spirits is a very good thing that you brought that up. I think, and I've, I've been working for NGOs uh, for a large part of my career, I think the role of... Um, advocacy groups and uh you know using tools like such uh, documentaries uh or drama mentories or whatever you call them uh is is extremely important it's uh it, it raises attention uh it, you know it, it, it sort of uh kicks everybody out from uh their uh convenience or sort of uh, you know sort of position of uh, i don't know like Okay, I think somebody else is going to do something. So, so I, 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 I believe and, and I think that it continues to be important to raise the alarm bell. However, what I've seen, and I see this at all levels, if you always raise the alarm bell, you ring it like mad, you know, people are just going to get used to it and it doesn't stand out anymore and people are going to phase out. And you can't blame people for that because how many alarm bells currently are ringing, right? The war and then, uh, you know, the oceans, and uh, here, this and that. In the Netherlands, it's, you know, the farmers are, are, are demonstrating, uh, rightly so, but there's always a lot of alarm bells. So so you can't always have that alarm bell uh, for, in this case, uh, the ocean. And also, um, raising the alarm bell and saying, do something for uh, a problem that is so complex uh, is not helpful, right? Because people don't know what to do. So if you break things down uh, and you can uh, work locally uh, on a problem that uh, local actors uh, recognize, they agree on it, then they can also solve it. So for me, uh, and again, what I try to contribute is to help articulate and understand uh, what 
the problem is and how small it is and then find the people that have the ability or are part of it uh, to then uh, address that uh, directly. I think um, you know the, the role of uh, advocacy, advocacy groups and, and movies like Seaspiracy will uh, continue uh, to be uh, very critical and I hope that more and more people uh, keep making those, um, you know, documentaries and keep uh, raising the alarm bell, uh, you know, for the purpose again of uh, shifting baselines. What I've seen in my career gives me, uh, it makes it very easy for me to be optimist, uh, optimistic. Uh, however, uh, you know, uh, what I've seen 30 years ago there's not many people who get to enjoy that anymore. And so while I'm optimistic uh, over uh, where I see change happen, uh, you know, the next generation, my kids, the kids of our kids, uh, those documentaries and those alarm bells need to continue uh, to be uh, raised, but at a level. And I think with uh, sort of, you know, within a context that uh, do something uh, is clear what it is that we need to do. Yeah. When I was uh, 11 years old, my grandmother, who I lived with, she raised me, she bought me a bird table, so a bird feeding table. It was what I wanted for my birthday because I, oh, was, yeah. I was an obsessed ornithologist. From the moment I could read, all I wanted to read about was birds. And so we, we lived in a council house with a tiny little garden. And we put this bird table out in the morning and I put bread on it and seeds and God knows what else. And, and then I... I went to school disappointed that nothing had arrived. And when I came home, my my gran told me that there'd been this like flock of birds arrived a few hours later. So I stayed home from school the next day. My gran was pretty loose about sending me to school. And we put more bird seed out. And within 20 minutes, there were blue tits and there were great tits and there were sparrows and there were seagulls and there were magpies and there were blackbirds and there were starlings. And it was it was like she'd said it this kind of flock now i took my kids back to bristol before my grandmother passed away some probably it would have been f uh, three and a half years ago and i took them to the ho house that i grew up in and we spent half an hour in the backyard I, there were no birds there were no yeah. sparrows yeah. i grew up seeing yeah. sparrows everywhere there were flocks of starlings when i grew up there was none of that there and this is when i read this article about shifting baselines that was sent to me before yeah. speaking to you as yeah. i'm reading i'm going oh my goodness it's exactly what I identified in that very small moment. Um, I know you, we're short on time, and I, I'm going to ask you if you can come in when you come back to Indonesia, and we can have a Love long. To. We can have lunch, and I can share the farm. We can have a two-hour, or as long as it takes, in the podcast because I've got so many more questions for you. So when you've got your hard awesome. stop, just say. But please tell me about shifting baselines, and, the, and more importantly, the importance of it, the understanding of it, or the appreciation of it moving forward. Yeah, look, so what I've been saying uh, so far, um, you know, it's almost uh, academic and it's also based on, uh, you know, sort of my learning over the years. But um, when I think back at how I got motivated and what still motivates me, it's really those experiences in nature or those experiences at sea, as you know, you, you say it yourself or uh, meeting with people that uh, have knowledge about something that I care about. And so uh, the uh, work that I think is uh, in front of uh, a lot of uh, you know, people who are concerned with the oceans um, is not easy. Uh, it's tedious. Uh, there's a lot of competition, for example, uh, between NGOs. Uh, but also for researchers to get access to finance in order to, you know, bring the solution uh, to a reality. And so uh, that motivation of uh, individuals that have a passion and they care about something that they then want to uh, protect or, or help manage, be it social or, or environmental, I think is key. And, uh, and, and my real um, concern, therefore, is what can uh, the young people or, or the generation that currently makes the decisions, not all of them are very young, what can they see or what is uh, possible for them to experience so that it motivates them and it helps them understand what they need to do. And that's really why uh, sometimes I can't sleep. So, uh, you know, the opportunity, and it's, it's not available for everybody, 
to, you know, we, we obviously we can't go back in time, right? Uh, but we can compare um, how uh, food production systems, uh, you know, are, are, are productive in one place versus another. Uh, we can, uh, you know, uh, compare uh, what a certain ecosystem looks like. You don't have to have a PhD for that. Uh, you know, as I was saying, you know, the water in the base, the inlands where I've been in the last couple of days, is, it seems ex extremely healthy. It's very clean. Uh, there's lots of, uh, it seems, normal growth of uh, sea plants. And when I talk to people uh, who fish, they say, yeah, yeah, no, it's just seasonal, but we catch enough. So, so th there are places where, um, you know, some type of solution apparently uh, has resulted in uh, a system, an ecosystem that produces uh, as, as you would expect. And there are places, unfortunately, where this is not the case. And so I would say, you know, for uh, people who are responsible, uh, like decision makers, uh, to manage their ocean or their part of our oceans, so to say, uh, to, to, to try and be invited and actually take the chance to have an experience in a place where things look and, and are uh, still uh, quite good. Because back in time, uh, none of us can. And so uh, I think what is left is to go out in nature, uh, try and be your own little sort of researcher uh, and, um, and compare places where uh, things look good and, and and sort of balanced and, and it's not again it's not difficult to, to figure out what, what what that means and then and then uh, learn from that yeah i like to go out in nature and act like i'm a would-be scientist and i i actually do try and live as much as i possibly can to the sort of scientific method always seeking evidence and you know i am prone to my own cognitive filters as are some of the greatest scientists i've ever met um how do you as a an environmentalist and somebody with such deep knowledge of environmentalism, conservationism and science, how do you live your life? I mean, do you buy into the current um, sort of layers of guilt that are put upon us all not to be flying around the world and not eating meat and fish and uh, only buying new clothes every 25 years and making sure it's organic cotton? Or do you have a more pragmatic approach? <laughs> Yeah, I, ha I have a I have a very pragmatic approach and uh, and and still a lot of guilt. <laughs> so I mean, I guess, I mean <laughs> oh, probably, I'm so pleased it's not just me. Together. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a lot of guilt, but I'm also trying to be pragmatic. I, I've learned that um, you know, for me to to try and give what I can, which is um, you know, I'm, I'm less and less directly involved in in management decisions. Um, but to, to share my enthusiasm or my energy and my knowledge to people who are, uh, I need to be in a good place. And um, that good place for me, uh, you know, is, is, is determined by a, a couple of things. And for me, that does include uh, eating fish. And for me, that does include uh, being able to go to uh, wild places of nature, or places of wild nature. And so, uh, you know, I pragmatically, um, and th this is sort of, you know, I, I enjoy uh, being able to do that. And then my guilt kicks in and then I want to work even harder to do something useful with that, uh, you know, position of, uh, you know, in, in a way it's like real luxury and privilege that, that I have. And so that's sort of how I deal with it. <laughs> yeah, I drive a 500cc motorcycle, which is totally unnecessary, but I'm a, I am like riding really fast motorbikes. But then I only buy organic cotton clothing made by Patagonia. Yeah, I, yeah you know, there you go. Like, yeah. You know, um, and well, I, eat, I, eat, I eat a lot of shellfish and I try and not eat too much of the bigger fish like tuna and, and the likes. I typically avoid farmed fish. Um, yeah. And it's trying to find that balance. You know, I love cigars and whiskey yeah. once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, but that's what it is. But now you've created this podcast and I'm sure you're doing lots of other things as well. And so I, I think that every individual, um, you know, can, can, can try and do their best. Uh, and that's just about it. And then um, doing your best means that you are responsible to not be ignorant. And you are responsible not to do harm if you can avoid it, right? That's sort of like the lowest level. 
But then as you uh, get less ignorant and as you educate yourself, there will be so many solutions that you could totally adopt in your life. And as you talk about it uh, with others, which is basically what you're doing, you're starting to grow that group of less ignorant people who apply increasingly more of the better solutions. And this is what I find with this high performing fishery. It is important to make money in any sector. Yeah. yeah? And the private sector is pivotal to any nation's development because when they make money, they will invest it. They will take some risks. You will have innovation and new solutions, better solutions will come. But this is just like a little sidetrack to say, you know, the economy uh, part, we are part of it by consuming, yeah? But then what we try to do is we, we are not ignorant. As we learn things, we adopt and apply better solutions where we can ourselves. And then we try to grow, you know, the adoption of those uh, with people amongst and around us. That, that's how I see it. Yeah. You have, you but have. I have lots of guilt, nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can celebrate our guilt when you come here. Over, we can. I'll get a Let's bottle of. Or, we'll drink organic wine. You listen, look. You've lifted my ignorance beyond its current level to, uh, or, or out of ignorance, I should say, with your answers today. It's been absolutely incredible. I know you've got um, to get on, and I've had over an hour of your time. Um, what? Are, just you. before I let you go, what are you working on? Where could we? Where could listeners? find you are you on social media do you have instagram or any of that sort of stuff or a website uh yeah i'm uh i'm, I'm on uh, linkedin I, I love it I, I would recommend people to go on linkedin um it's just a uh wonderful platform i learned so much from it but anyway i'm also on it and uh yeah i'm gonna be uh to traveling to madagascar uh in a couple of weeks time um, back to Indonesia, uh, so I'll probably uh, post a few uh, things on uh, my LinkedIn account. And what's your LinkedIn account if people want to um, connect to, to you on that? Do you know? Or uh, we'll put it in the show notes. It's anyway. my name. Yeah, I put it as, yeah. Le just Google Lida Petsuda. <laughs> yeah. And okay. in, maybe Indonesia. That's an easy tag. <laughs> Fantastic. And we'll put it all, uh, like I say, in the show notes. Um, and um, please, 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 when you get back to Indonesia, let me be the first person to know so I can invite you over for lunch and we can continue the conversation because I didn't ask any of the questions on my sheet. Oh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even get around to it. <laughs> I want to know about Next the Accelerating time. Ocean Protection, six strategies and turtles and all sorts of stuff. So that we'll leave that to next time. Uh, Lida, it's been an incredible privilege to speak to you over the, the last hour. Thank you so much for coming on and I look forward to seeing you soon. Cheers. Enjoy Cornwall. Cheers. Take care. I will. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.